Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Dawn in the Rocky Mountains can feel like the beginning of a new world, and so it's an appropriate time and place for me to discuss the Norse myth of creation. Now, in both the account of Voluspal and in the account of Snorri's prose Edda, the very beginning is Ginungagap. Now, note that the pronunciation I will use throughout this presentation, as on other videos on my channel, is reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation rather than the modern Icelandic pronunciation uh, that is becoming more popular uh, in Old Norse classes. Uh, Ginungagap is a compound word. Actually, in Voluspal uh, stanza three, I believe it is, we read gap var ginunga, so the gap was ginunga. Uh, gap is gap, and ginunga has been interpreted two compelling ways. It could be related to the root in English yon. It could also be related to the root in gin regin, the powerful god. So this is either something like the yawning gap, i.e. the empty void, that certainly makes sense, or the mighty void. Either one, of course, is a compelling explanation, and the double meaning could, of course, be uh, somewhat intentional. So in Voluspa, in stanza three, we hear gapvar ginunga, gras huergi, nesvalar unir, etc. There was nothing, there was no earth, no cooling waves, no grass, just this, this gap. Now it is Snorri who explains what comes next. He says that there is a watery region on one side of Ginungagap, and that is Nivelheimer. This would mean something like fog home. And then on the other end is a fiery region. This is a Muspel or Muspelsheimer. There is a shrew scattering, scampering around in the snow right here. Um, now, from the well that is in Nivelheimer, that is called Huergelmir, water flows into Ginungagap and it freezes in the cold Ginungagap. But then some of that ice gets near to the fiery end in Muspel and melts, and the drops drip out the first living being, and that is Ymir. Now, Ymir, uh, his name has plausibly been etymologically interpreted as twin, however, he does not have a twin in the surviving stories about him, but it could be that originally there were two twin beings. Uh, Tacitus hints that early Germanic peoples believed in uh, ancestry from a being they called uh, twin, so that's compelling. Uh, Ymir is called a Hrim Thurs by Snorri. Uh, Thurs seems to mean the same thing as Jotun. It is a giant. Of course, that does not mean necessarily huge being, uh, but rather uh, these this rival families of the gods from which the gods are also descended. Now, Hrim Thurs specifically, that would mean rime or frost giant. It is not certain whether this reflects the ancestry from these ice cubes or if this is just since frost and such have negative connotations in a, in a cold world like, like uh, that of the Norse, if this is just meant to suggest they're extra evil or something, or if titles like Hrim Thurs are used instead of just regular Thurs or Jotun, basically for alliterative purposes, right? We want to alliterate with an H, so we call them Hrim Thurs instead of Thurs. At any rate, Ymir is said to be ancestral to at least most of the Jotnar or Thursar, the giants. Now, you could reasonably ask how Ymir alive before all living beings, and uh, without any women around, could be the ancestor of anything whatsoever. And in fact, Odin asks the same question of Vavthrudnir in the Poetic Edda, in the poem Vavthrudnismal. And he is told by Vavthrudnir that the earliest giant, uh, and in this poem he's called Aurgelmir, but this is the same being as Snorri usually calls Ymir, that uh, that Ymir, and Snorri picks up on these same details, that Ymir sweat during the night, and from his armpits, he sweated out the first generations of Jotnar, or giants, and that at the same time, his two legs were having sexual relations with one another, and that the two legs conceived uh, some of the Jotnar. Now, I forgot to mention the second living being, that was Audumbla, a cow, and it is her milk that uh, Ymir feeds on in the, in the earliest times. And Althumbla also licks out of 
some of the ice that's in Ginungagap, the third living being, and this is Buri. Now, Buri is going to be ancestral to the Asir, to the divine line, to the gods. Buri is going to uh, marry or otherwise have sexual relations with um, an unnamed, uh, uh, apparently Jotun woman. Uh, their child will be Bur, if you read uh, the um, account in uh, Voluspal, but Bur in the Prozeta. And uh, he marries or has relations with Besla, a Jotun woman who is the daughter of a Jotun named Bolthor in Hovmal or Bolthorn in uh, the Prozeta. And their three children are Odin, Vili, and Ve. Uh, Odin, of course, being the chief of the gods. Vili and Ve uh, don't come up in many narratives outside of these uh, early creation tales. Now keep in mind that this is not, uh, even as Snorri tells it, a 100% uh, coherent tale, although Snorri is trying to combine these different details from Volspa and Vafthu the Small and probably sources we don't know. Uh, for the most part, we have to recall that poems like Volspa and Vafthu the Small are composed for people who already know the story in question. Uh, so consider that if we were at some kind of a uh, football game together and then you asked me to write a song about it later, I probably wouldn't write a play-by-play, quarter-by-quarter story about the whole thing. Probably instead I would pick some major events, some milestones to celebrate in, in my different verses, right? You know, Von Miller forced a fumble or something like that. A thousand years later, that'd be a lot harder for somebody to understand but for your contemporary audience, which is really what uh, most artists uh, want to reach, it's uh, a more artistic uh, 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 product because of course you are also kind of showing or helping your audience show that you're all part of one common uh, body of reference. It's just unfortunate that a thousand years later, of course, we're no longer part of this common uh, party of reference. But let's get back to Odin, Philly, and Ve. Now, for reasons that are unclear, Odin and his two brothers, Vili and Ve, kill Ymir, their uh, great-grandfather. And they tear apart his body, and uh, the flood of blood that issues forth becomes the oceans and seas. And they use his flesh to build the earth, and they use his bones to make the mountains, and they use his teeth to make the boulders. His eyelashes become a fence around the interior world uh, known as Midgarder, the middle enclosure, and that is the interior surrounded by this outer ocean um, of blood, and then there's an interior ocean inside of Midgarder. And uh, his brains become the clouds, and the skull is cast up above Midgarder to be the sky, and it is held up by four dwarves whose names are Nordri, Vestri, Sudri, and Austri. I probably don't have to explain what those mean. All right, but where the, do the dwarves come from? Uh, we are told by Snorri that uh, the gods found these maggots crawling in the flesh of Ymir. Remember, of course, that um, the earth is built out of the dead flesh of this giant. And they turn them into man-like little beings. Uh, Voluspa uh, hints at something similar, although of course without the details, but then Voluspa goes on to give us the names of the dwarves, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> no one has ever satisfactorily explained why that's there. Uh, sort of like the catalog of the ships in the Iliad, it just sort of trips you up as you're reading through the story with this long list of things. Uh, however, this is where, where uh, J.R.R. Tolkien got the names of the dwarves in The Hobbit, so this is where you'll find the original Fili, Kili, Bomber, Thorin, Oakenshield, Akenskeldi, and of course even Gandalf, Gandalf. Not a dwarf in J.R.R. Tolkien's mythos, but his name comes from the list of the dwarves in Voluspa. Where do humans come from? In Voluspa, we read that Odin, together with Hunir, a very mysterious figure who seems to come up basically at creation and at Ragnarok. And a figure named Lothar, who's never been satisfactorily explained, he occurs nowhere else. Odin, Hönir, and Lothar are walking along and uh, they find Oskar and Embla. These are the traditional names, the first man and first woman in Norse myth. Um, fateless, Urlog, Laus. And uh, they give them 
their uh, wit, their spirit, their breath, and their human appearance. Snorri adds the detail that Oscar and Embla are originally pieces of driftwood that are found alongside uh, the shore. But Snorri, instead of having it be Odin, Hunir, and Lothr that uh, give these uh, original humans their breath and their, their looks and their wit, it is Odin and his two brothers, Vili and Ve. At least that's implied by the fact that Snorri says that it's Bur's sons. So uh, we are originally uh, driftwood, given life, and uh, this is a poetic image that comes up quite a bit in Norse poetry from uh, throughout the Old Norse period with uh, men called uh, various kinds of masculine forms of trees and women called various uh, uh, feminine trees because of course Norse has grammatical gender like Spanish. Some words are masculine, some are feminine, and some are neutered. If you have a masculine word for tree, you can use it for man. If you have a feminine word for tree, you can use it for woman. Oscar means ash tree. Embla may be related to a word for elm tree, although it's not the normal word for elm tree. And of course, it's compelling to note that the world tree, Yggdrasil, or Yggdrasil's Oscar, is an ash tree itself, an Oscar. Uh, so man is made of the same material that the central spoke in the Norse conception of the cosmos is made of, which is, a, uh, I, I think, a, a, a beautiful and compelling image. Now, how about Yggdrasil itself? Uh, the Volva in Volospa, I believe in stanza two, says that she remembers Mjotvid Maran Hirmold Nedan, the great fate tree below the earth. Now, this great fate tree below the earth is probably Yggdrasil. She goes on to discuss Yggdrasil as a great ash tree sprinkled with white clay. This is a uh, a typical image used in describing Yggdrasil. And uh, at its feet, at least at its root in the world Oskarthr, is a root called Urdarbrunnur, the well of uh, Urthr, one of the three Norns. Now the origin of the Norns is never discussed, but these three sisters, Urthr, Verdandi, and Skuld, uh, determine the fates of both gods and men by carving on wood somehow. Um, we we're told in, in Volspa they, they skoru o skivi, they carved on, wooden, on a wooden stick. Apparently, uh, our destinies are sort of spelled out for us on a wooden stick somewhere, perhaps at Urdar Brunner. Um, how much of the creation and such is the, the determination of the Norns uh, is never exactly said, although presumably they have something to do with creation and uh, the exact details. Um, simply elude us now because Volspa doesn't doesn't want to tell us and Snorri may not know. Now, uh, Yggdrasil has, it's traditionally said to have three roots. Grimnismal, which is the only poem that discusses this, says those three roots are in Hel, uh, the, under, the underworld of the dead, in Jotunheimr, the world of giants or Jotnar, and in Midgarder, the world where humans live, this interior uh, land. However, it seems from the fact that Urdarbrunner is under one of the roots that if there are three roots, that um, maybe the correct explanation is that one is in Hell, one is in Jotunheimr, and one is in Oskarther, and that's the one that has um, Urdarbrunner under it, because the one in Jotunheimr has uh, Mimisbrunner, the well of Mimir, where Odin left his eye, and Heimdallr probably left his ear uh, in it. And then the one in uh, Hell is chewed on by Nidhogr, the uh, dragon that lives in hell, as well as by numerous serpents, says Grimnismol. So Yggdrasil seems to somehow pin the realms together. There's never a really clear uh, uh, picture that we're given of exactly how this works, though. Uh, you'll find online and in books a lot of different artistic representations of what the Norse worldview looks like, and I'm not convinced that any of them uh, really reflect any kind of general understanding uh, in the Viking Age or later. Uh, I've shown you on, on, on the screen uh, my idea of what Mithgarther looks like as a uh, interior ring of land with an interior sea surrounded by an outer sea uh, that has Jormungandr in it. And of course our interior land that we live on, this Mithgarther, is surrounded by this fence made of Ymir's eyelashes. That's what makes it a Garther, an enclosure. And then beyond that, uh, that exterior sea is Jotunheimr. But where Osgarther is, the, the realm of the gods in relation to us, is a little bit unclear. Bivros, the rainbow, is the bridge to it from Mithgarther, but it doesn't consistently seem to be a place in the sky. 
and the way that Snorri describes it as being in the sky, of course, could be due to uh, Christian influence. Snorri wants things to be a little bit more Christian. He wants heaven to, or Osgard to be above us and hell to be below us. While hell does seem to be below us, Osgard could be uh, elsewhere, but it is reached by the rainbow by Bifrost. Now, astronomical phenomena are not discussed in much detail in the creation myth in uh, our Norse sources, nor anywhere in our Norse sources. Um, we hear about someone named Mundilfuri or Mundilfari, depending on which manuscript you read, and uh, he is the father of uh, the moon, I believe also of the sun. Uh, however, this is the moon and the sun who are persons. There also, according to Snorri, is a moon and a sun that are things. And the moon and the sun person are appointed by the gods to pull the moon and the sun in chariots. Um, the moon is chased by a wolf named Hati, the sun by a wolf named Skull. Their names mean hate and bald, so <laughs> one sounds a little more intimidating to me than the other. Snorri says that the lights in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, etc., are originally sparks or flames from Muspel that the gods scatter around in the sky in order to light the worlds and in order for them and for us human beings to tell the time, uh, the seasons, the years, and etc. Uh, but in general, the scattered accounts of what astronomical phenomena are from and what they do and who they are, perhaps, um, in Vastri the Small, Grim the Small, and Snorri are, are conflicting and uh, confusing. But I hope that I've given you a sense of the uh, colorful and compelling narrative uh, of the creation that we find in uh, Norse mythology, thanks to the poems in the Poetic Edda and Snorri's Prose Edda. If you've enjoyed this video, I hope that you'll look for some of my other videos. There's more than 250 now, uh, most of them made in beautiful places in my Rocky Mountain homeland of Colorado and Wyoming. I've also translated the complete Poetic Edda and I am working on the prose edda, though that probably will be out in the early 2020s. These videos are supported by my community of Patreon backers. Uh, please consider uh, joining me on Patreon, where we uh, have a great community of people interested in Norse mythology and language and um, a Discord forum uh, for talking about such things. That's been a really good, lively place of discussion. For now, from beautiful Wyoming, I'm wishing you all the best.